Okay, okay, we're recording uh, Eternal Card Breakdowns again, because I uh, was doing the Omens of the Past breakdown, and I got sort of distracted, I think, away from them at some point, and we never finished breaking down Omens of the Past. So I'm going to go through the rest of the Omens of the Past cards, and we're going to talk about all of them. We're going to basically break them down. Uh, as you probably know, well, if you've seen these before, my general breakdowns is I talk about them, I basically talk about the card, what I like about it, what I think it builds into, uh, what it builds into in ranked decks, and whether or not it's good in draft. Uh, the things I'm most concerned with are where you can put it in a ranked deck. Typically, uh, if we're looking at like good or bad cards, uh, the idea is that like I think that most good cards in ranked decks are, or people, what people objectively consider to be good cards in ranked decks are just cards that you can put into a lot of different ranked decks, like, say, Sandstorm Titan, which fits everywhere. You just put that in all of your ranked decks and it's all good. But, like, bad cards are still cards that can actually be played in ranked decks in most situations. There are a few that can't, um, like, uh, for example, Oasis Sanctuary. But most bad cards do have a slot where they are a better card than another card of their same cost and color and influence. And like, I'm very interested in bad cards for that reason, because uh, like, I don't think that there is really a, a lot of bad cards in Eternal. There are a couple, but for the most part, if you're looking for like ranked cards, uh, we have like a scale for them. But what I usually do is I'm just like, here's where you can build this. And then in terms of draft, it's like, is this a card that you can play in draft? So that's that's what we want to talk about. That's what we want to like sort of break down. I think I've talked about this a little bit before uh, for card breakdowns, but I wanted to sort of put that out there before we talked about them. Okay. So today I'm going to do shadow cards. We're going to go backwards in reverse order because uh, the justice card breakdown does not appear to be up on YouTube, and I'm not sure if I'm going to have to redo it, and I'm not going to do them like... It. So we're going to do them all out of order, and it's crazy, crazy fun. Uh, some people are asking questions in the chat. I'm going to answer those as best I can. This is for YouTube, so it's okay to ask the questions, and I'll usually just sort of mention them as they go on, but I probably won't credit. I'll just be like, hey, yeah, if you if there's a thing that you mention, I, I, I might mention it in the actual thing. Okay, so yeah. All right, so let's talk about openers. Um, or let's talk about shadow cards. And we're starting things off with minotaurs. Uh, so we are in Omens of the Past, and Omens of the Past has a heavy minotaur theme, and it actually got a heavy minotaur theme as a result of like a lot of interesting things. We were all looking for really good minotaur cards, and then Tavrod just kind of came around and busted minotaurs wide open so i'm uh, super pleased with uh, how they are uh, going about as i'm saying that chat can talk someone is like have my baby okay so yes um and yeah we can use the premium versions as well all right so Brash Shorthorn is the first of our Minotaurs. It is a one cost two one Minotaur that is just a blank slate. And that is actually okay. Like in a ranked deck that is using in particular Tavrod, uh, you can play this card. Having a two one for one is fairly reasonable. Um, it is not, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> just slipped on my headphones and yanked my headphones down okay so yeah it is fairly reasonable to actually have a 2-1 one for one it's not a bad card in that respect there are obviously better 2-1s for one there's pyro knight there's oni ronin there are a ton of 2-1s for one in general but having a 2-1 for one basically the extra ability on it is often not actually all that meaningful because what you are generally trying to do with a 2-1 for one is push two damage and you're trying to push two damage very very early so this card actually has a reasonable amount of early game strength. It's not losing that much from losing that skill. And sometimes if you just need an aggressive curve, Brash Shorthorn fits into that deck. It's not a great card uh, in decks that are looking for high card quality in aggro decks, but if you have A, a Minotaur theme, or B, a really, really fast deck that has to play one drops at one, then Brash Shorthorn might fit into it. Most of the time, that deck is going to be in red, and you're going to have a lot of better options. But if you're in Argent Port Colors, Brash Shorthorn actually belongs there and does some pretty cool things. So yeah, should be should be fun. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, first Minotaur does pretty well. There are a couple of Minotaurs that, in particular that pay attention to it. There's a card called Relentless Gorehorn that gives plus two, plus O2 oh Minotaurs, and that's pretty strong. And in draft, this is actually just a perfectly reasonable pick if your deck is looking for a tempo draft. But most of the time, you aren't going to pick it because it's a fairly low card quality card. Uh, basically, you are only doing it if you're trying to go hyper fast in either draft or ranked. And in those situations, it usually is okay. All right. Okay, so Fallen Oni. One, two, summon the enemy player, discards the top unit of their deck. This card is mostly a trap, but uh, it has some interesting positions in ranked decks, and I have actually had some success with this. Uh, there's a Strife Crow Felm list, uh, I believe it's called Inexpensive Felm on my YouTube, that I've been playing with Fallen Oni lately, and I've actually really liked it for that. So let's talk a little bit about this card, because it's really unusual. So this is an inverse of Oni Ronin, of course. Uh, the 2-1 that does cool things to the top unit of your deck, instead it is a 1-2 that does bad things to the top unit of your opponent's deck. Uh, lot, lots of cute synergies there, uh, but it is a, a worse card in general that does not fit into nearly as many decks. If you manage to discard the top unit of someone's deck, typically what that's going to do is delay a unit by an average of 2-3 to three turns. Is that a good thing? That's not necessarily a good thing. It does mean that your opponent has a higher chance of drawing power and spells. It means that they are still going to be ahead on value because you're playing a very, very low cost card in order to sort of get advantages over other people's cards. And it also means that they're gonna be able to activate certain dredge abilities, uh, which is to say any card that actually uh, behaves with the void in some useful fashion. So they can turn Dark Return into a unit when they wouldn't otherwise have a unit. They can reactivate Dawnwalkers that gets it discarded, and Dawnwalker activations off Fallen Oni are just the worst thing. Um, so there are a lot of things about Fallen Oni that can be very unimpressive, and the main thing about it is that it does not generate any pressure on its own as an aggressive unit. However, if you're playing a kind of slow control deck using cards like Shadowlands Guide and Memory Dredger, there is a case for Fallen Oni. Do not go too deep into this card because completely locking down your opponent's board by just or your opponent's deck by playing Fallen Oni over and over and over again is neither possible nor a good idea. Um, it is a lot of fun and can very, very occasionally work, but most of the time they're going to have units in their hand, and if you aren't playing enough cards that actually just remove those cards, then you're going to have issues later on in the game. In particular, when you're using recursion effects with Fallen Oni, you oftentimes will have better fallen, better targets for that recursion. Um, but I have found that if you're playing this deck in a deck with Shadowlands Guides and Memory Dredgers, that uh, it is a card that can be fairly reasonable, especially if the deck sort of caps out in something that really allows you to benefit off of having units that stick around on the ground, particularly Champion of Cunning, who makes any small one drop into a big threat. So, delays cards, kills off things like Akaria and other stuff that you really don't want your opponent to draw, uh, does fun things to Warcry, all of that's pretty interesting. Card quality of it is very, very low, so you really need a very specific deck and a specific game plan to make this work, and I would not recommend it unless you absolutely know what that game plan is. Um, beyond that, in draft, this card is... Uh, I would say fairly poor, like extremely poor in fact. There are certainly situations where discarding the delaying your opponent's units can be a good game plan again, but it again is not a card that actually generates any pressure on its own, so it's really hard to justify it in draft. But yeah, an interesting ranked card if not a great one. Jack's Knife. Plus two plus two, summon the wielder deals two damage to you. This is a comparative card to Knife Jack, of course, someone engaging in a lot of fun wordplay here, uh, which is Knife Jack is a 2-2 two, two for 1 that also deals 2 damage to you. I think Jack's Knife is probably slightly better than Knife Jack, although certainly if you're playing with Shadowlands Guides and uh, other things that actually get back 1-drop units, uh, there are some ways in which Jack's Knife might be worse. But this card does generate a very, very competitive stat advantage for a pretty significant disadvantage. It's really, really good at generating some sort of aggressive situations. I think the card is kind of reasonable in certain aggressive ranked decks and can be very strong if you have ways to 
just sort of enhance the amount of damage that you're dealing with this card. Uh, I haven't played with it much myself. I don't really like this style of card. I'm not a big fan of Knife Jack or Jack's Knife. They're very, very spiky cards, but the stat value that it offers is actually quite significant and can be way better than you would expect because this does generally render any unit that you're playing it on uh, usually immune to Torch and typically immune to a lot of other cards that your opponent is going to be wanting to play on you. So can be good for generating a lot of early advantage very, very fast. Uh, a good little spiky card if you want to be kind of aggressive, but uh, be wary of that summon effect. It is often deceptively difficult to deal with, or deceptively uh, bad for you in ways that you don't really necessarily account for. Um, yeah, I think this card uh, is above average, solid, solid aggressive card. Uh, in draft, it is worth picking up because it does make units bigger, but you do have to be wary of that two-for-one card disadvantage. It's, again, a very high-tempo card where you're trying to be very aggressive with it, and if you aren't being very aggressive with it, then you're probably losing the game. But works well in some competitive flyer decks, uh, works well in kind of interesting aggressive decks. There are some ways that Jack's Knife can actually generate a really significant board advantage very, very fast, and it's probably something to pay attention to if you're looking at aggressive, st aggressive styles. Yeah, ease of use. Uh, Darkest Tempest is mentioning. That is definitely true. This card is very, very simple to use in draft, and it makes your units bigger in a way that's actually very, very hard for them to deal with. All right, Swear Vengeance. Give one of your units revenge. Okay, so this is a tech card. Um, giving a unit revenge is not the same as, say, Dark Return's ability to get that unit back from the void. But if you are giving it revenge, then you get to interact with it in other special ways. So if, for example, it has an echo effect on it, then Swear Vengeance is a lot better. If it has a destiny effect or a fate effect of some kind, Swear Vengeance is a lot better because it, well, uh, yeah, I mean, like, in all of those situations, Dark Return actually does very similar things. But uh, if you are playing this card with Dark Return, then you have some interesting options available there. Like, there's a lot of situations where you can make this card work. Uh, in particular, I love this card in Crown of Possibilities decks because you can give uh, Clockroaches Swear Vengeance, and that can be a really, really fun way to do things. That being said, Revenge is a fairly unreliable mechanic. Um, it is somewhat difficult to really... Uh, play with very actively, and what this card is offering you is not card advantage, nor is it necessarily board advantage. You do get some board advantage out of it later, because it does respond to, in the same way that a protect responds to, a uh, removal spell. But if you are giving a unit revenge, and then you just don't see that unit for the next, like, five to six turns, that can often be the situation where you lose the game. So... Uh, in Ranked, I only like this deck if you have a lot of interesting tech built around Revenge, specifically the ability to uh, scheme into your deck and pick those cards out, uh, the ability to really have cards that like benefit from Revenge very, very heavily. Um, anything where you can actually just like uh, take advantage of Revenge and use it in interesting ways, Swear Revenge is a lot better card. I do like that it's a fast spell. I think it's a really reasonable response to having something uh, killed, and the fact that it can be played very flexibly makes it a lot more interesting in that respect, but you do have to have a decent game plan to make Swear Vengeance work, because you really really need to be working on that. Um, in draft, I don't like this card very much at all. Having a unit with revenge doesn't usually help you that much in draft. It is true that you're going to have a higher chance to draw revenge units in draft, but uh, it basically is only something you should pick up if you have a very high quality set of cards that you're sure are going to be recurred a lot. Things like, oh, I don't know, Lathrai Ranger, where you're like basically trying to get infiltrates stacked on top of this card. Anything where you're trying to actually get significant amounts of recursive advantage, uh, that can be pretty good to stack Swear Vengeance is on in draft, but I wouldn't pick this card very highly. Works on Hero of the People, this is true. Uh, anything where you can give skills to a unit that doesn't otherwise have skills can be very useful in terms of generating recursive advantage. All right. Talk tick. 1-1, one, one, Revenge, Clockroach. Very important that this is a Clockroach, because there are only two Clockroaches in the game, but uh, one of them buffs the other Clockroaches. So that means that we have a Clockroach tribal card. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I think my friend was a designer on this card. I'm not 100% certain, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a really cool design. So yeah, it is Revenge 1-1. Uh, 
I like this card a lot. It's it's very, very fun. It obviously only belongs in one deck, and that is Clockroach uh, Crown of Possibilities, or just general Xenon Clockroach. If you are playing with a lot of roaches, then Toctic actually does a pretty reasonable job, because what it is is it is a cheaper Dark Wisp that can be devoured pretty easily, uh, comes back to life later on, and then just basically essentially gives you that extra card's worth of advantage as a sacrifice outlet. So Toctic is actually pretty reasonable in sacrifice decks, and it's very, very good in Quackroach decks if you are playing around that sort of concept of just having a lot of different card advantage, playing around with uh, lots of card draw. This card belongs with Devour. You definitely want to have like four Devours in your deck if you have four Toctics. It's a good way to sort of stack extra Dark Wisps, and it's a good way to stack onto the Clockroach idea. It isn't a terribly strong card in terms of pressure generation. You really need the Clockroach buff to make Toctics scary, but if you're trying to just leverage out things like Brimstone Altar or Devour, it's a worthwhile consideration. It's not going to be the star card in those decks, but it actually can be very reasonable. And there are certainly some situations where you can give it Echo or do other cool things with it. It's just cheap enough and recursive enough that it has a lot of interesting combos associated with it. So yeah, overall the card does not have an incredibly high card quality, but it's really fun in synergistic decks, and I think that it fits very well because it's so cheap to play and so like just interesting. Yeah, I like this card quite a bit. In draft, I would almost never pick it. Um, it. It is actually okay in draft as a filler card if you have a lot of sacrifice outlets in the form of Ravenous Thorn Beast, Devour, and uh, the 5-5 five five that draws you two cards when you sacrifice a unit. We'll be getting to that one in a bit. So you can play it as a sort of uh, slightly worse Dark Wisp in those situations, and that's actually quite reasonable in draft. All right. Longshot Marksman. Quick draw, ultimate, pay 60 of Longshot Marksman, plus 2, plus 2. This card has not proven to be very effective in ranked. Having quick draw is very useful on a 2 drop, but having 1 health is not, and there are not very many 2 drops that can survive having 1 health, even if they have an ability that prevents them from basically, well, that allows them to do things like trade with Temple Scribe. But, you know, there are cards like Temper, there are cards like Vara's Favor in particular, and Vara's Favor is sort of the damning card for Longshot Marksman. The fact that that card is very, very common in Shadow decks means that this card just doesn't really work very well in Ranked. You could maybe play it in like a tournament setting if you know that there aren't going to be a lot of Vara's Favors, but it doesn't actually generate enough stats that you'd be willing to do that. There's a lot better 2-drops in this slot. However, in draft, this card is very strong. It is a 2-1 quick draw that is actually super aggressive. The pay 6 to give plus 2 plus 2 is something to do with your time that also means that you get some better advantage out of this card later on. And that flexibility of, uh, basically, that flexibility in the middle game is actually very, very strong. It's a really important ability for cards to have, and it tends to be most powerful in draft mode. So if you're playing in limited modes, Longshot Marksman is pretty strong. In ranked, uh, probably don't bother, but an interesting card nonetheless. It is also part of a cycle. Piercing Grief. Lifesteal Revenge Charge. At the end of your turn, sacrifice Piercing Grief. Uh, this was the card I was most immediately drawn to at the start of Omens of the Past, and I know that I am not the only one. I think this is one of the most, par most popular cards in Omens. It's not the best card in Omens. It is just really, really fun. <clears throat> okay, so this card has many interesting synergies. The thing that is most commonly played in right now is Hero of the People decks, because it has three abilities on them, and they're all very relevant to Hero of the People. It's also very cheap, so you can play Hero into Piercing Grief on 5 and get a very significant swing that you like a lot, as well as give your hero a pretty sticky ability that allows Hero to come back later and get even more skills. So that's all really, really beneficial. The thing about Piercing Grief that's really, really interesting is that it is a lifesteal card, that basically just deals some damage and gains you a little bit of extra health. That can be very useful against aggro decks. This card, however, does not represent any form of card advantage. The thing you have to remember about revenge cards is that they typically, while they do replace themselves and essentially play themselves twice, Piercing Grief is essentially just a 6 damage bolt that will hit all of the targets you don't want to hit and gain you a bunch of life in the process. 
Six health for two is actually not that terrible. Uh, Water of Life is, I think, maybe even kind of a playable card, but Piercing Grief will also usually deal three damage to the face, and that makes it much closer to playable than Water of Life is, which is to say <laughs> Water of Life is only on the fringe. So yeah, Piercing Grief is a card that will typically hit your opponent's face on two. Uh, on the next time that it comes out, it will probably just run into a unit, but sometimes it will get a decent amount of extra damage in. If you're playing in a pretty heavy control set, uh, there's a Mokto Revenge deck that really likes this card for that reason. Uh, it is a card that actually does a reasonable amount of damage and adds that damage to your deck without really giving you a lot of disadvantage. So that's really strong. But it does not present you with any board advantage, which means that you can't build out from this and sort of tempo spiral. You need to play this card in either slower control decks or interesting combo decks, which is to say uh, the one that I like it the best in, of course, is Clockroach decks. It is really, really fun in Clockroach. Uh, Grief Roaches was the first deck that we built out of Omens, and I really, really liked it there. Uh, it is something that is just... Yeah, so this card fills a pretty interesting niche. It gives you some interesting answers to aggro, but it doesn't actually solve the problem of aggro in the long run. You still have to have something at the top to sort of sweep the board, like Stray into Shadow or Harsh Rule or Lightning Storm. And if you can do that, then Piercing Grief is actually really going to help you out in the early game because it's going to give you that extra health gain as well as a little bit of extra push for your control deck. And control decks typically very much lack in the ability to push damage on your opponent. So yeah, this card fills a lot of very interesting niches. It is not as strong as it seems and certainly shouldn't be a uh, include in all decks, but I really do like it in control decks that really want to live uh, in the early game. So, pretty interesting card. Very good to give Predator's Instinct and Xenon Initiation to. If you can play this card, immediately give it Predator's Instinct and then kill something with it, you can get a lot of card advantage out of the card. Uh, very fun in a lot of different combos of that type. Hero of the People is another one that's very, very good. Crown of Possibilities, you can have a lot of fun with that. Anything where you give it Echo, that's really good. Yeah, Revenge has many, many interesting sort of synergy type situations where you can just generate really interesting combos, and I think that Piercing Grief is a very fun card for that respect. Scare! I haven't found a ranked deck that would like this. <laughs> It might exist, but it's pretty hard to do. Um, there aren't that many units that have so much health that Scare is going to be reasonable to be used offensively. There are quite a few zero health units that are pretty easy to kill with Scare, but at the same time, this is a faction that has access to Annihilate, Suffocate, Death Strike, um, Devouring Shadow. There is a lot of good removal, so you really don't need subpar removal to sort of get rid of things that you just generally are kind of worried about. Um, and Suffocate in particular is just so much better than Scare in that respect that it's a little bit awful. Scare is nonetheless kind of flexible. I think it's interesting as a draft card. It's kind of fun to play around. I wouldn't be too invested in this card. I'm not even sure if I would pick it very highly uh, just because it was removal, but there are maybe a couple of situations where you have uh, you don't have enough removal. Scare gives you a little bit of removal, and it also tends to be fairly flexible with other things. So, um, yeah, this card does not really wow me in either limited or the in either draft or ranked formats. But it is something that you could keep an eye on. There may be a combo with this card that no one's really played with yet. I don't think it's in ranked though. All right, threaten. Give one of your units plus two strength. This card is probably not terribly playable in ranked. The permanence of the ability is the interesting thing about it, because it is a fast spell ability, which means that if you're playing a lot of quick draw units in particular, Threaten can be very, very powerful, because quick draw and Threaten together means that you have basically that extra bit of strength, and it is essentially just like a very, very small rapid shot, where you kill your opponent's unit, and then you also have a permanent benefit after that. So it's good with cards like Cabal Countess, it's good with Longshot Marksman, it's good with anything that just needs a little bit of extra strength, and it can be fairly relevant in that respect. It certainly does make it so that any unit that you are going to be recurring over and over again gets a lot scarier, it's good on lifesteal units. All of this, however, are th things that are more useful in draft than they are in ranked, because Threaten does not provide you with any survivability for the unit, and it does not necessarily mean that you are going to trade better. So 
typically, unless you have a very, very good reason to, you're not going to run Threaten and Ranked. In Draft, you should pick this card if you've gotten a lot of long shot Merxpence, and if you don't have enough removal or like general aggression. I think this card is actually quite reasonable in Draft, but it definitely needs to be put on the right types of cards. That is to say, zero health cards like Excavation Assistant, and quick draw cards like uh, Rebel Sharpshooter or Long Shot Marksman. It's even okay on some of the other like three health activators like Bright Mace Paladin, but I wouldn't super recommend it in that situation because it is card disadvantage that you are naturally imposing on yourself. Think of it as kind of a bad weapon, like it's worse than an ornate katana, but being a trick means that you can actually use it to get some really good benefits out of quick draw units in draft, and doing that can be very, very good for you. All right. Amethyst Ring. Once per turn, you may pay three to deal one damage to the enemy player and gain one health. This is one of the most reliable and consistent ways to generate a life force trigger that there are in ranked or draft. That being said, it's very expensive, so it's a hard, hard card to be using. I would maybe play this in ranked if I really, really needed that lifesteal activation, but the cost of it is pretty high and the benefit is not that high. It is true that the lifesteal ability does actually make this a little bit more beneficial, but I think overall Amethyst Ring is just not doing quite enough. In draft, you definitely do want to use this in Life Force decks, because Life Force is a hard deck to build, and if you can actually get it going with multiple Katras or any amount of, like, if you get, like, five Discipline Dominaras or something like that, Amethyst Ring will be kind of useful for you there. It is also an inevitability engine if your deck is very, very heavy control and you just don't have a way to win the game, but I wouldn't really say that that's your best way to win the game. Most of the time, Eternal games end before Amethyst Ring is going to be that beneficial, uh, it is kind of interesting in that respect like it is something that is just inevitable in a way that your opponent really can't deal with but it is so slow that it is not actually going to matter in eternal where basically that sort of really really slow grindy control style is not heavily rewarded um nonetheless you can play this in particular in draft for life force decks and while life force decks are a little bit difficult to build um, if you are very very fond of them uh, i do recommend amethyst ring in that situation Okay. Cabal Slasher. Life Force, when you gain health, Cabal Slasher gains that much strength. Okay, so this card is not terribly strong uh, because that three health is actually really, really damning in ranked in particular. It's just enough to be torchable. The card does not have a lot of inherent attack by itself. And while you can gain a ridiculous amount of life and make it very, very heavily attack oriented oftentimes what you're going to get is something like a 6-3 which uh not actually all that good of a stat line that's like pit fighter stat line um yeah typically if you have a lot more strength than health that's still not that great a unit especially in ranked in draft this card is a pretty reasonable life force card that you can use with uh, water of life or other like other good life gain cards to sort of get a decent amount of aggression going on but it's going to trade pretty evenly with other things because it has no evasive abilities uh it is something that you can build into a very very big attacker and then try and kill people with but there are a lot of ways that this card is going to die before it actually becomes too threatening so i'm not super on cobalt slasher's side in ranked or draft but I think that it has a place in certain life force decks if you're trying to be very, very aggressive. Okay. Cat Burglar, 3-2 Deadly. Summon the enemy player discards a relic of your choice from their hand. Okay, so for three, this card is a little bit stat inefficient, but Overall, it's probably strong enough to be played in ranked, especially because the relics that it hits can be very, very important. Like if you're hitting Chalice or Xenon Obelisk, both of which are extremely popular relics in ranked, then that's going to be a very, very good way to get not only card advantage, but also a unit that answers big, big stuff. This card is probably especially effective now that there is kind of a, uh, a Xenon glut, I would say. There's going to be a lot of sort of auric interrogator type decks that will have sandstorm titans cat burglar trades pretty well with sandstorm titan generally demands removal and also kills a relic so can be pretty useful in that respect not always going to hit a relic which means that it is often just kind of an inefficient deadly unit 
But if you're playing a sort of Xenon Killer type deck, it's a very good sideboard card. It's a extremely good sideboard card for tournaments, and uh, yeah, it actually sees some play in ranked. I think that you can play it in ranked if you think that there's going to be a lot of relics out there. And if you're having particularly hard times with Chalice, then Cat Burglar is kind of a good card for that. In draft, this card has deadly and is probably reasonably playable for that reason. It is going to trade evenly with just about anything. It's going to do pretty well with killer or any sort of other ability that you can get on it. Xenon, Initiation, and Predator's Instinct both really sort of benefit this card in a way that is, yeah, pretty well on your side. It can get rid of lots of bigger targets. It can stall for you in ways that you are pretty happy with. The stat line on it is not amazing. It is going to be just better than average in both ranked and draft. Extract. All right, this one's a winner. Um, in draft, this card is actually bananas, like dealing three damage, getting a little bit of life stabilization, and then doing the scry ability, looking at the top card of your deck and putting it on the bottom, is all really, really good. Like, this stabilizes you, it removes a threat, it gives you life gain, which is actually very relevant. Like, if you have things that not only do some kind of card-for-card -card trade, but also get you a little bit of extra health, that is actually a niche that you really need to fill in ranked. A lot of times what you are looking for is card advantage combined with the ability to survive aggro, and Extract is a card that does that very, very well. So this card gets rid of very, very small units, like uh, Oni Ronin, uh, Rakano Outlaw, and you know, like basically anything in the Rakano suite. It kills them, it gives you a little bit of extra life, and then it also allows you to sort out your library a little bit, or sort out your deck. Wow, I haven't used the word library in a very long time to describe decks. I think I'm kind of out of practice here. But nonetheless, uh, it sorts out your deck and gives you a better chance of drawing whatever it is that you need next. And that particular effect is very, very strong. It is a hard ability to use, but it is extremely good for making sure that you get the kind of RNG that you want out of the game in a way that is very, very beneficial to you. So if you're having lots of issues with RNG, this is a card that actually should be a fairly high priority in your deck. In draft, this card is even better for exactly the same reasons. It is a really good removal card in draft because it hits a lot more things in draft. It is an extremely good card for all of the reasons that it's good in ranked, and it's removal, which is just super important. Like, you absolutely need this card in draft to sort of set things up. This is a very, very high pick common in draft. It is one of the common bombs uh, for, like, Shadow. Like, or, uh, I don't know if you call it, would call it a bomb, but it is... Like, it is one of your highest picks in Shadow. It is an extremely strong draft card. You should absolutely be getting extracts if you can. Um, I think this card is super valuable and is going to get you a lot of benefit in a very short period of time. A Thrive Memory Keeper. A 4-1 Elf Explorer. This is an explorer, so uh, works with... Um, what's it? Evelina, Valley Searcher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beyond that, I have no particular remarks on this card. It's an okay draft card if you want to fill a spot and be kind of aggressive. Four attack is pretty reasonable, but uh, that one health is pretty damning. Uh, there are a lot of things in draft that deal one damage, and this stat line is just not good enough for ranked, so I wouldn't play it in that situation. Um, but nonetheless, it is kind of aggressive. You can do some interesting scare tricks with it. I think that, for the most part, not really going to be seen a lot in draft or ranked, but can be played in draft if you want to be pretty forward-facing, if you have enough good removal that just having a vanilla 4-1 is going to be a pretty good choice for you. Memes to an end. Okay, so life force activation. When you gain health, discard that many cards from your deck. Then if you have no cards in your deck, sacrifice means to an end to deal 25 damage to the enemy player. <laughs> um, yeah, so this card is probably one of the worst legendaries in the set, but that's okay. Like, it is nonetheless a pretty fun one, and we've already discovered a couple of really interesting decks to play around it. There's a fun Infinity Combo deck with Infernal Tyrant, Shadowlands Guide, uh, Shadow Infernal Tyrant, Shadowlands Guide, oh gosh, this is, this is a complicated one. Infernal Tyrant, Shadowlands Guide, um, 
Slumbering Stone and Vara the Fate Touched combined with means to an end. And if all of that sounds like a little bit difficult to assemble, it is, but at the same time, means to an end is putting all of those cards into your void, which is where you need them to be in order to activate a Grasping at Shadows and just get the whole combo out in one go. Means to an end gives you access to an impressive amount of graveyard uh play so you can do some really cool things with grasping at shadows you can do some interesting things with dark return you cannot do anything with excavate because if you excavate then you will gain health and discard whatever it is that you just excavated fun facts in addition if you want to actually get the 25 damage you do have to actually activate life force on the turn that you run out of cards because when you run out of cards you have one turn to basically just deal your damage kill your opponent and if you don't do that then you lose so this is ridiculousness. Um, yeah, I think overall this card has some reasonable strengths for just fun, fun combo decks. We've played a couple of, we've played around with a couple of them. I actually have been meaning to do a video on the Infernal Tyrant combo deck for quite some time, so we might do one of those this week. Um, but yeah, I think that overall it's an okay ranked card. It's an okay draft card for the reason of basically you just have a lot less cards in your deck. So if you have a really good like life force means to an end deck, you can actually get a reasonable amount of play out of it. I have seen that deck go seven wins on multiple occasions. Uh, I think I've done it once myself. It is fun. It is not like super powerful and it is something of a trap, but if you pick this card up in draft, you should you should go with it because it's funny. <laughs> or at least, you know, yeah, just have a have yourself a laugh. Um I think this card is just super fun. I think it is actually pretty reasonable in some situations, but it is not going to be by any means a ranked powerhouse. You can get your win rate with it. You can't get a positive win rate with it. All right. Skeeter 1-2 Flying Life Steal. This is a great life force activator in slower draft decks. The stat line is not really there for ranked, but it's pretty close if you have seen an Obelisks, if you have other things that benefit you. Like, the, the extra health actually is kind of meaningful. This is probably a better card than Vampire Bat in terms of draft and ranked. It is just, like, even though it's slower, it is just more reliable at getting across that damage, and it's more likely to live in draft in particular, which is kind of important. I think Skeeter's going to be an okay draft card for you if you're trying to activate Life Force and if you're trying to get some sort of benefits out of that. If you have some good weapons, it can actually be pretty reasonable. Um, this card is very, very average in draft, but nonetheless, an okay card if you have weapons, an okay card if you have Life Force, and sometimes going to be the star card in those situations. Sorrow Shroud. One, two, when the wielder dies, you gain health equal to its health. Um, so this is a really interesting weapon. It is not typically playable in ranked, just because the stat line is not that great. But the extra health, the extra damage, and the cost, combined with the actual, like, sort of interesting uh, amount of lifesteal that you are getting out of it, like, all of this tends to go your way. This card is extremely friendly to you in ways that you might not necessarily see. Typically, if you're looking at a card like this, this just doesn't look aggressive enough. It looks like it's kind of a defensive card. It looks like it's kind of not doing things. But I've found in draft this card is actually very, very reasonable. Not only does it make the unit that you put it on pretty hard to kill and typically require that that unit be killed by two or more cards, it also gives you that extra bit of health in a way that is actually really quite good for you. So, like, you can activate some pretty useful life force triggers, you can get enough health to survive in some aggro situations, and then because it is a weapon, you can put it on things like Auric Bully and uh, the new Minotaur that also benefits from weapons. There, it goes pretty well on flyers. Like, I've just found this card to always be just exactly useful enough in draft. So, I wouldn't pick it super highly, but it is definitely a weapon that you can put on things in draft that you will find to be pretty useful, so I would recommend that you give this card a try if you have not. Uh, ranked, just don't play it, but interesting. Spur on! Revenge, give one of your units plus one strength and unblockable this turn. So you play this once, and then you get to play it again at sort of a random time later on. This card is really good in infiltrate style decks, especially in draft. It is also a good finisher in draft, which is a really meaningful reason to pick it up. Uh, it does not provide you with real card advantage because it does not actually create any sort of permanent benefit to the board. But if you're trying to create a finisher 
situation. If you have a lot of big things or if you have a lot of infiltrate cards that are really, really good if they get through, then Spur On is absolutely the card for you. This is a card that does similar things to Trickster's Cloak and Minotaur Lighthoof. I would probably prefer... Uh, I'd probably go Light Hoof, then Trickster's Cloak, then Spur On, but at the same time, all three of those cards do very, very good things, and I think that they're really worth picking if you need that particular effect. And this is a card that you do definitely want. The Revenge ability is going to be typically happening at very useful times. Once you get into top deck mode, uh, that is typically a time where you're just trying to get like the last five damage across, and Spur On is very likely to trigger and actually get that to happen. So well worth considering, uh, very good for pushing. I would say that it is better than Ghost Form uh, in particular. So Ghost Form, then Spur On, then Trickster's Cloak, then Minotaur Light of, in terms of all of the unblockable effects that you want. All right, Trigger Happy. Your units get Quick Draw this turn. So for three, this is a really reasonable effect in draft. Um, it is just a... Like, if you have big units, which you're probably going to have in Shadow, if you have forward-facing units like the Thry Memory Keeper, for example, or if you just have, like, a reasonable amount of sort of aggressive stuff, Trigger Happy is going to get you oftentimes a 2 or 3 for 1 trade. It is just a rapid shot on everything in terms of, like, trying to actually stabilize the board. And if you can get that kind of effect to happen, you're going to be very, very happy with it. It is not a flexible card. You need to have offense-oriented units that are very, very consistently attacking to get this card to work, and you need to basically always be bigger than what your opponent is doing. That kind of win more effect means that it's really not going to happen in ranked, but in draft, this card is playable, and if you have the right type of deck, it can be devastating. I think that overall, it is not a super high pick, but if you need a trick, it is a pretty good one. It can be a very good small trick, and it can be an absolutely insane big trick. All right, Cabal Bludgeoner, 3-3, three, three, plus 2, plus 2, while wielding a weapon. This card doesn't quite do enough in ranked. A 4-cost unit is generally just going to have better stats in ranked. In draft, a 4-cost unit that is a 5-5 five, five on top of a weapon is probably going to be pretty scary. This card is going to be around like a 7-7. Seven, seven. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. If you put a Sorrow Shroud on this, this is what, a 6-7. It's not bad. Uh, yeah, so basically, if you're playing a weapon-oriented deck, then Cabal Bludgeoner is certainly a reasonable fit. Uh, beyond that, I wouldn't pick this card particularly highly, but I do think it is reasonable if you have enough good weapons. And it's pretty good with the Quick Draw Weapon, the Sorrow's Shroud, the Trickster's Cloak. There are a lot of reasons that Cabal Bludgeoner can actually get across for a ton of damage and become a very, very devastating unit very, very early. It is not as good as Auric Bully, but it's really close. Cripple. Give an enemy unit negative three, negative two. I don't even like this card in draft. It is not a playable ranked card by any means. Uh, in draft, it is just good enough removal. You can pick it up if you don't have a really good unit. I would actually say that you should not value this over units. Uh, but if you basically like just don't see anything that's going to be particularly good for you, Cripple is a reasonable way to sort of answer your opponent's threats and give you a little bit of board advantage. So you can use it to knock flyers out of the sky, you can use it to uh, do some bad things to things. Like in general you want to be very careful with this card, you want to try and save it for anything that just has two health, because you don't really want to be crippling anything that has more than two health. Even though it often takes that unit off the board for a while, that unit will probably become a threat again later on, and then you'll just really not feel happy about having used cripple at all. I think that it is a reasonable draft card, just because it is removal, but it's pretty bad removal at that. Alright, Hate Cleaver. 3-2 Life Force, when you gain health, Hate Cleaver gains plus one plus one. This card is usually a one for one, but a one for one is good, and if you can actually get it to activate, then good. Uh, I think it is quite playable in ranked. There are a lot of ways to get a ton of life force triggers and actually get Hate Cleaver going. Uh, it's not going to be amazing in ranked, but there are certainly some life force decks that might actually want it. And uh, there are going to be only a few of them, but can be pretty reasonable. In draft, I really like this card. This is just, you, I mean, a 3-2 weapon for 4 is absolutely just right 
away the kind of ticket that you're looking for. And then if you can also basically get it into an infinite armor state where you're attacking with Oasis Seekers or activating Sanctuary Priests, then Hate Cleaver becomes really, really devastating and can just win the game for you. So it is a removal spell that sometimes wins the game. That's really good in draft. You should absolutely be looking for cards like this. Um, and yeah, in Ranked, I think it is a similar thing. It is a removal spell that sometimes wins the game. It's not a very good removal spell, so it's pretty much in your game plan if you're going to be running Hate Cleaver. But if you can actually do it, then yeah, it's worth it. Memory Dredger. 3-4, flying. When Memory Dredger hits the enemy player, play a unit with cost 2 or less for your void. Oh, water. Water is good. This card is actually quite a bomb in draft. Um... As a unit that is fairly hard to kill, that is also evasive, that also has card advantage attached to it, and also generates a lot of damage, like, those are all really good things. It's very efficient to play. It is just, like, it's really quite capable of getting across and winning the game. So this should be a super high pick in draft if you're going to pick it up. In Ranked, you need the deck to really sort of fit this style, but Memory Dredger is very playable. Uh, our inexpensive film deck runs it. I think that it is quite good with Slumbering Stone and Dark Wisp and a lot of other cards. People have certainly uncovered that this is not a bad card at all, and the fact that it dodges Vanquish in particular is really, really interesting and strong. It is a monocolored card, so it is vulnerable to Annihilate. That is not an amazing thing for you, but at the moment, like, uh, eh, you know, there are a lot of things that are vulnerable to Annihilate. I think that Memory Dredger is kind of a slow game plan, and that is the one thing about it that's a little bit tricky. It is something that you really need to play in a deck that is very heavily built around Memory Dredger, and you also need to be able to protect Memory Dredger, which is not easy to do. But... Uh, there are a pretty reasonable amount of decks that can run it. It is mostly just for the Feln archetype with Champion of Cunning, but it does fit there, and it fits very well there. It's a very powerful card. Minotaur Lighthoof. One of the most powerful uh, uncommons, I think. This card is just an extremely solid draft uncommon that also is perfectly reasonable in ranked. Uh, it is 4-4 four, for four, 4. Very good stats. That is, uh, I think I mentioned... Uh, in time card breakdowns, if we've done time card breakdowns already, that a 4 4 for 4 is just a super reasonable amount of stats. Like, you just get everything that you want out of that, and it feels really good. Like, it's just... It's it's quite good. But the summon you may give another un unit unblockable this turn means that you kind of really push that card over the edge, because what it is doing is it is securing you lethal in very various situations, and it is often just giving you that extra bit of... Uh, damage that you need. It is also triggering infiltrates, and that's really, really important. Minotaur Lighthoof is the card that you play right after you play Direwood Beast Color to win the game. If you are playing uh, one of the early decks that you can build in Eternal to just sort of get started is Feln Haunting Scream, which is to say Direwood Beast Colors, Gorgon Fanatics, uh, Lathrai Rangers, like anything with a lot of good infiltrate, uh, and Lighthoof. And if you do that, like that is a deck with commons and uncommons that can easily have a positive win rate and can actually get you up to master. I think Lighthoof is a really reasonable card in that respect. It generates a pretty big threat on its own, and then it also makes those infiltrate decks all that more scary. So yeah, really cool ranked card. Uh, should see some play and might even need to see more play than it does. It is just a pretty reasonable play in a lot of decks. I've seen this card in particular with... Uh, Tabrod, because it is a Minotaur, and it's one of the best Minotaurs. So uh, it is quite strong, and yeah, it's not going to be amazing in every deck, but if you have something that you really want to give unblockable, then it's the right card for the job. All right, Relentless Gorehorn, a 3-3 with Revenge. Uh, summon your other Minotaurs, get plus two strength. <laughs> Minotaur Tribal is probably not strong enough on its own to be an amazing ranked deck, uh, at least not this particular type of Minotaur Tribal. Tavrod Minotaur Tribal is still perfectly reasonable. But nonetheless, this card is kind of fun, and you can certainly build that deck and probably have a reasonable win rate with it. Uh, I would say that this card is probably stronger in draft, because it's a 5-3 with Revenge. And that alone is good enough. Like, it is just a really reasonable stat line for a draft card. It is a card that is somewhat sticky and will trade with at least one thing and almost certainly two things. 
it is just going to be a pretty reasonable card in draft that does a lot of good things for you. You don't even have to build that heavy on Minotaurs. Uh, the thing that Relentless Gorehorn might do to lose you more drafts than it wins you is cause you to force more Minotaurs than you normally need to take. So be wary of that. But this card is totally reasonable on its own, so absolutely play it. Oh yeah, it's not a 5-3. Sorry, it's other Minotaurs. So it's still a 3-3 three, three for 4. Yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, it trades very well in draft, and it's quite good in that situation. Um, it does buff other Gorehorns, and that's why I was considering it as a 5-3. But no, it does not actually buff yourself. That's, that's entirely true. Okay, Savage Stranger. 3-3 three, three. at the end of your turn, Strangers get plus 1 Strength. There are enough Strangers now to actually make Strangers pretty good in Eternal. Um, there are some pretty good ranked decks that can actually run certain strangers. I wouldn't say that Savage Stranger is generally fast enough or correct enough for ranked decks, but uh, it does certainly give strangers a level of inevitability that might be useful in a very specific stranger build. I will say no more on that. I don't know what the build is. I certainly haven't uh, found a deck that I like Savage Stranger in. I think it's out there, but... It's probably pretty niche. In draft, this card is quite reasonable. It is a 3-3 that almost immediately becomes a 4-3. And then it is, you know, a 4-3 for 4 is just very reasonable stat line. And then in addition, it buffs all of your um, fixer strangers, which is something that you really, really want. This thing has sort of a discount champion of cunning effect. It's very easy to activate, and it is very, very threatening. So... Well worth playing, especially if you can get your hands on Soaring Stranger as well, in which case you just have a win condition. Xenon Fanatic. 3-1 Life Force at the end of your turn. Deal damage to the enemy player equal to the health that you've gained this turn. Uh, so this card is not good on stats, but is a very clear win condition that works very well with all sorts of Life Force decks. Uh, it's good in draft specifically because it just kills your opponent. Like, they're... If you put this card down, your opponent has to answer it or it's going to kill them because you're going to have so many different ways to gain life that you're actually going to deal just a really significant amount of damage. I see Zen and Fanatics usually hit like 6 to 9. Um, they can also go for like the whole like 20 or so that you need to push across. So Zen and Fanatics, very scary, need to be answered pretty quick in draft. That's that's a pretty big deal. In ranked, this card is a 4 cost card that dies to Vara's favor. And that's a big deal. I would say that it's almost not playable in that situation. But the thing that is interesting about it is that you can play it down at the end of a turn in which you have gained a really substantial amount of life. So if you have a heavy lifesteal deck or some sort of situation where you can gain an intense amount of life, then Xenon Fanatic is the card that you play just to end the game, like right there. And that is a reasonable combo that you can see in a ranked game. I would not say that it's going to happen very often, but... A very specific game plan, definitely worth trying out in that situation. Okay, Colony Matron was a promo card. I think we talked about this card a little bit. It is on the low power side, but turns out to be pretty okay in sort of dark chalice builds. If you're playing a 1-5 that also happens to generate a lot of other little 1-1s, one then that's something that you can really do a lot with. And getting 3-3s three with lifesteal off of chalice is really, really good. The card is a little too slow and a little too uh, inactive to do a lot there, and it doesn't play in draft because it's not a draft card. But uh, certainly okay if you are playing it in sort of the slower control style. I think there are a lot better cards that you can be working with, but I've had some fun with this one. Obrak. Obrak the Feaster. Flying Revenge at the start of your turn, sacrifice a unit. This card has a lot of traps involved with it, but, oh man, it's fun. Uh, stat line's super good, and the stat line is good enough that it is definitely a ranked card you should consider. Um, there are many situations where it might be good. The ones I've been trying out lately have been sort of Xenony styles, but it's definitely more of a fit for Stonescar with its many, many sacrifice outlets and its different sort of interesting units that want to be sacrificed. This card works well with um, Slumbering Stone, with Dark Wisp, with Grenadins of all shapes and stripes. The thing that's kind of scary about it is that sometimes you play it down and your opponent just throws removal at everything that isn't Obrak, and then Obrak removes himself, and that can be a problem. I've also found that with multiple Obraks, the different triggers can be a little bit tricky. It's hard to 
basically the first obrock that triggers has to be the one that sacrifices the other obraks. So that's something to note. I've actually uh, accidentally sacrificed two obraks to themselves just because I wanted to keep one obrak. Um, I don't know. There, there are some things about his ordering that make me a little sad. But for the most part, this card is really good if you can give it killer or charge or other interesting abilities. And the revenge ability is quite relevant. And it's very good on defense. Like, even if you aren't going to be able to uh, attack with it, like if you just have to play it down on five, that's sometimes reasonable because you get a 7-7 seven, seven blocker in the air, stops impending doom, stops a lot of other scary stuff, goes away at the end of your turn, and then comes back later when you could actually use it. So sometimes worth playing at five, uh, even if you don't have anything else. Most of the time you really need a deck built around this, and you really need everything to go right with it. But... The right game plan makes this card very, very strong because it is insanely high stats for its value. So, all right. Okay, Umbrin Thurster. 2-4 with Life Force. When you gain health, it gets plus one strength and flying. The stat line on it, combined with the fact that it is just like not that good of a flyer, uh, means that it's not really going to be a playable ranked card. This is clearly a draft card, but it is a pretty good draft card. A 3-4 flyer for 5, which is assuming you can get even one activation of the life force, is a scary card. Like, that is something that you're actually going to be able to deal some damage with. So, uh, any sort of big evasive flyer can be very scary. 4 health is a lot of health for a draft flyer. So, if you can actually get the life force deck going, Umbran Thurster is a reasonable top end. I wouldn't go too heavy on this card, because you really need the life force activations to make it work. But it's a good one or two of... And uh, if you have, like, all of the right stuff going on, this card is going to win you a couple of games in draft. Direwood Prowler. Summon, you may sacrifice another unit to draw two cards. It's a 5-5, five, five, so not unreasonable stats, especially in draft for a 6-drop. Trades with almost everything at 6. Uh, the sacrifice other unit to draw two cards is what's really beneficial about it. It definitely gives you some amount of card advantage, and it's good for eating a lot of the smaller units that are not as beneficial in the early game, uh, or in the late game as they are in the early game, which is to say Dark Wisps or Slumbering Stones. Anything that you can get, like Talk Ticks, anything that you can play down that makes Direwood Prowler better, this card is a pretty good just one-hit activation that's going to be really solid for you in draft. In Ranked, this card is a little too hard to play, I would say. The attached draw is quite useful, as is the Forced Sacrifice, but it's just a little too inefficient. Slime Spitter Slug. Summon each flying unit gets negative one, negative one for each of your units. When an enemy unit dies, you gain one health, and Slime Spitter Slug gets plus one, plus one. There's a lot going on with this card. So much so, in fact, that this card is a really reasonable ranked play. Like, it does not seem like it's going to be that good, but it absolutely is. Not only does it kill flyers completely and totally and forever, but it also gives you a consistent source of life gain and a fairly devastating threat that will continue to get bigger unless it is dealt with. This card has to be answered, it does do something on the board, and it gains you health. All of those are really good things, and all of those are really good things together. Uh, there's a reason that this is one of Rhino's favorite cards in his Xenon decks. Uh, I don't play it nearly as much, but I do think it's a very respectable card. It's especially good in sideboards for tournaments, but I think that it actually sees a lot of play in main boards as well. And there's good reason for it. Like, you can actually just totally wipe out a particular genre of card. Uh, as soon as I started playing Huru Flyers, this card started showing up a lot more. And uh, that is absolutely the correct answer to seeing a lot of Huru Flyers. So if you're seeing a lot of Flyers, this is a card that you should definitely consider running. Um, slower control card, definitely more suited towards the mid-range style. If you're going to be playing a lot of big expensive units, Slime Twitter Slug is a very good one or two of. In draft, this card is bananas. Um, does everything that you want. Kills flyers, which are some of the scariest cards in draft. It is extremely big, means that it's always going to trade with something, and it gains you life, which is also good. Cabal Rogue. 5-1 unblockable. So this is a draft finisher. It's not a great one, but it's definitely one that you're going to want to pick if you don't have a good finisher. I don't have too much else to say about it. It definitely doesn't play well in ranked because the, the rate is just too inefficient. Um, but draft-wise, this card is just something that you play if you want to kill your opponent and you want to do it in five or less turns. Like, 
that that is exactly its job it does that very well so if you don't have a way to finish the game then this is a card that you need to pick up uh, you don't need to pick up more than one of them so just make sure that you have one or two of these cards in your deck any type of finisher is something that you should be looking at in draft uh, how highly you pick it depends on how badly you need it inspire obedience kill an enemy unit your unit units get plus one strength this turn I like this card even better than Cabal Rogue as a finisher, um, but that's just kind of the types of decks that I build. It is an okay removal spell that kills a particular thing. The rate is too inefficient for ranked most of the time. Uh, I think there's there's maybe one ranked deck that I might play this in. Just, you know, it's kind of okay because of the minor rally effect and the fact that it is just unconditional removal. But yeah, that rate is really, really bad. So overall, the thing about Inspire Obedience is that it's just usually a good way to end the game. It's very similar to Cabal Rogue in that respect, and I really like it for that reason. I like this card a lot. It is a card that, unlike Cabal Rogue, is going to probably positively affect your board, even in situations where it doesn't win you the game. So that uh, tends to lead me towards liking it a little better than Cabal Rogue. All right, and that leads us to our last card, and one of our most fun ones, Sleepless Night. Revenge, discard your hand and draw four cards. <laughs> oh man there is so much to like about this card so four cards is i think the most cards that you can draw in a single card draw in eternal and that's pretty cool because this card actually draws eight it will not ever draw you four cards and then draw itself it does not shuffle into your deck until after you've drawn your four cards so that's important to note you draw four cards and you put this in the top ten and then if you draw it again, you might have to discard some of the four cards that you've drawn. But you're pretty likely to get at least four cards worth of value out of this, probably around six. Which is pretty good if you manage to uh, basically get your hand empty before you cast Sleepless Night. That's a very solid finisher. This card is very good in any sort of big control deck that needs a couple of ways to draw cards at the end of the game. Um, in particular, I've seen it see play in Big Xenon. Um, it's really interesting, I think, in sort of Stoneskar decks that want to discount on cards, because Stoneskar decks are very good at throwing away cards and also generating power advantage. I've never been able to get it to work with Trail Stories or Kindle, but I really want to. Um, overall, I think this card is just a really strong control card that has some interesting synergies, in particular with Revenge decks, because it is a card that shuffles you through a lot of the top cards of your deck very, very quickly. So... Uh, one of the things that'll see the most play in is sort of mock -e control decks, anything where you're playing a lot of revenge cards and you want to do basically just a lot of shuffling through your deck very, very quickly. Decks with Piercing Grief, decks with mock decks with uh, uh, Clock Roaches and other shenanigans going on there. Like Sleepless Night is a card that will definitely get you a lot of things going on. Um, yeah, but refilling your hand is not the only is the only thing that this card does. So be careful about that, because it is an 8-drop that does nothing to the board state, and that is a very scary position for a control deck to be in. You have to be generating a good board state of your own through other means, particularly cards like Dawnwalker or uh, Whispers in the Void, things that actually are doing things on the board, Ephemeral Wisp, anything that is just like making stuff happen without you having to spend power, uh, gives you a better option to use Sleepless Night, because those types of things typically require that you spend a lot of cards on something that's not doing enough to the board, and then Sleepless Night will push you over the edge in those situations. I like it in those situations in particular. In draft, this card is hard to pick, but can be worth it. Um, definitely does the job right. I would say that basically if you can get to eight, then maybe pick it up, but uh, probably not going to be a super high pick for you. It's fun though. Lots of fun. Okay, that's uh, that's it. That's all of the shadow cards for Opens of the Past. To the YouTube folks, thank you so much for watching. We're going to do a couple more of these, hopefully this week. And uh, uh, to the Twitch folks, yeah, we're actually going to be wrapping up the stream as well. So see you guys in just a bit.